So we start with our quote once again. New beekeepers are told that the way to find the elusive queen is by first locating her circle of attendants. From the queen must die and other affairs of bees and men. So this quote we have is about finding the queen and locating the circle of attendants. So finding the queen and her supporters. So what could Lily be searching for? How could this relate to her? And here we go into chapter three. I love Thoreau best. Mrs. Henry made us read portions of Walden Pond, and afterward I'd had fantasies of going to a private garden where T. Ray would never find me. I started appreciating Mother Nature, what she'd done with the world. In my mind, she looked like Eleanor Roosevelt. I thought about her the next morning when I woke beside the creek in a bed of kudzu vines. A barge of mist floated along the water, and dragonflies, iridescent blue ones, darted back and forth like they were stitching up the air, Darted back and forth like they were stitching up the air. What kind of lit device is that? <coughs> Excuse me. Remember, it's a comparison using like. So what does that mean? It is a simile. It was such a pretty sight for a second, I forgot the heavy feeling I'd carried since T-Ray had told me about my mother. Instead, I was at Walden Pond. Day one of my new life, I said to myself, that's what this is. Rosalind slept with her mouth open and a long piece of drool hanging from her bottom lip. I could tell by the way her eyes rolled under her lids that she was watching the silver screen where dreams come and go. Her swollen face looked better, but in the bright of day, I noticed purple bruises on her arms and legs as well. Neither one of us had a watch on, but going by the sun, we had slept more than half the morning away. I hated to wake Rosaline, so I pulled the wooden, wooden pitcher of Mary out of my bag and propped it up against a tree trunk in order to study it properly. A ladybug had crawled up and sat on the Holy Mother's cheek, making the most perfect beauty mark on her. I wondered if Mary had been an outdoor type who preferred trees and insects over the churchy halo she had on. I laid back and tried to invent a story about why my mother had owned a black Mary pitcher. I drew a big blank, probably due to my ignorance about Mary, who never got much attention at our church. According to Brother Gerald, hell was nothing but a bonfire for Catholics. We didn't have any in Sylvan, only Baptists and Methodists, but we got instructions in case we met them in our travels. We were to offer them the five-part plan of salvation, which they could accept or not. The church gave us a plastic glove with each step written on a different finger. It started with the pinky and worked over to the thumb. Some ladies carried their salvation gloves in their purse in case they ran into a Catholic unexpectedly. The only Mary story we talked about was the wedding story. The time she persuaded her son, practically against his will, to manufacture wine in the kitchen out of plain water. This had been a shock to me since our church didn't believe in wine, or for that matter in women having a lot to say about anything. All I could really figure was my mother had been mixed up with Catholics somehow, and, I have to say... This secretly thrilled me. I stuffed the pitcher into my pocket while Rosaline slept on, blowing puffs of air that vibrated her lips. I decided she might sleep into tomorrow, so I shook her arms till her eyes slid open. Lord, I'm stiff, she said. I feel like I've been beaten with a stick. You have been beaten, remember? But not with a stick, she said. I waited till she got to her feet. A long, unbelievable process of grunts and moans and limbs coming to life. What did you dream? I asked when she was upright. She gazed at the treetops, rubbing her elbows. Well, let's see. I dreamed the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. knelt down and painted my toenails with the spit from his mouth, and every nail was red like he'd been sucking on red hots. I considered this as we set off for Cherberon. Rosaline walking like she was on anointed feet, like her ruby toes owned the whole countryside. Anointed, that'd be a good vocab word. We drifted by gray barns, cornfields, and needs of irrigation, and clumps of Hereford cows, chewing in slow motion, looking very content with their lives. Irrigation, another good word. Squinting into the distance, I could see farmhouses with wide porches and tractor tire swings suspended from ropes on nearby tree branches. Windmills sprouted up beside them, their giant silver petals creaking a little when the breezes rose. The sun had baked everything to perfection. Even the gooseberries on the fence had fried to raisins. 
The asphalt ran out, turned to gravel. I listened to the sound it, it made scraping under our shoes. Perspiration puddled in the notch where Rosaline's collarbones came together. I didn't know whose stomach was caring on more about needing food, mine or hers, and since we'd started walking, I'd realized it was Sunday when the stores were closed up. I was afraid we'd end up eating dandelions, digging wild turnips and grubs out of the ground to stay alive. The smell of fresh manure floated out from the fields and took care of my appetite then and there, but Rosaline said, I could eat a mule. If we find some place open when we get to town, I'll go in and get us some food, I told her. And what are we going to do for beds, she said. If they don't have a motel, we'll have to rent a room. She smiled at me then. Lily, child, there ain't going to be any place that'll take a colored woman. I don't care if she's the Virgin Mary. Nobody's letting her stay if she's colored. Well, what was the point of the Civil Rights Act, I said, coming to a full stop in the middle of the road. Doesn't that mean people have to let you stay in their motels and eat in their restaurants if you want to? That's what it means, but you're going to have to drag people kicking and screaming to do it. I spent the next mile in deep worry. I had no plan, no prospects of a plan. Until now, I'd mostly believed we would stumble upon a window somewhere and climb through it to a brand new life. Rosaline, on the other hand, was out here biding time till we got caught, counting it as summer vacation from jail. What I needed was a sign. I needed a voice speaking to me like I'd heard yesterday in my room saying, Lily Melissa Owens, your jar is open. I'll take nine steps and look up. Whatever my eyes light on, that's my sign. When I looked up, I saw a crop duster plunging his little plane over a field of growing things. Behind him, a cloud of pesticides parachuting out. I couldn't decide what part of the scene I represented. The plants about to be rescued from the bugs or the bugs about to be murdered by the spray. There was an off chance I was really the airplane zipping over the earth, creating rescue and doom wherever, everywhere I went. I felt miserable. The heat had been gathering as we walked, and it now dripped down Rosaline's face. Too bad there's not a church around here where we could steal some fans, she said. And what, was, what got them in trouble in the first place? The fans. We'll stop there for today. Make sure you do your exit slip, and we will continue on with Chapter 3 tomorrow.